Welcome back to the Deep Dive. Ready to explore some fascinating territory. We're diving into Norbert Wiener's The Human Use of Human Beings. A classic. Published in 1950, but it's like Wiener could see the digital age coming. He was already grappling with how technology was changing what it means to be human way back then. It's true. His insights are even more relevant now than when he wrote them. It's not always an easy read, though, is it? Not exactly a page turner, mm. but essential if you really want to understand the forces shaping our world today. Absolutely. And you've clearly marked up some key passages. Big questions. Right. Communication, how we learn, how machines learn, even the legal ramifications. It's like Wiener was connecting dots decades ahead of everyone else. It's those connections that make Wiener so insightful. See, he founded the field of cybernetics, basically, the study of how systems, whether they're living beings or machines, communicate and control themselves. Okay, that sounds pretty abstract. It is, but that's how he drew these shocking parallels between us and the machines we create. It's interesting you say shocking because even the title, The Human Use of Human Beings, it feels pretty bold, a little unsettling even. Like, it's not just about the technology itself, but the implications, almost a moral call to action. Did Wiener feel like we were at a turning point? Absolutely. He was concerned that scientists were so caught up in their own achievements, they didn't fully grasp what their creations could unleash. So the downsides of all this amazing progress. Yes. And he even warned about the public not really understanding these new technologies, which, as he put it, could be exploited at any cost. That's a chilling thought. Yeah. Especially today, right? When technology often seems to evolve faster than we can keep up. Exactly. Wiener was adamant that we can't let technological progress outpace our human values. To him, human beings, and what he called human things, were paramount. So not anti-technology, but urging us to be mindful, intentional about where this was all going. Exactly. What I find fascinating is how he defines what makes us uniquely human in the first place. He zeroes in on our drive to communicate, even above other social instincts, and he uses the incredible story of Helen Keller to illustrate this point. Her story is remarkable. I mean, to overcome such obstacles, mm. being both blind and deaf, and still crave that connection, speaks volumes about the human spirit. It does. And Wiener was captivated by Helen Keller's almost desperate drive to communicate, despite her disabilities. He saw in her something fundamental about our nature, this deep-seated need to connect, to engage with the world, to make sense of it all. Makes you wonder what he'd make of our hyper-connected world today. But before we go down that rabbit hole, you've also highlighted his concept of patterns. It feels connected to communication, but even more foundational. It is. Wiener believed that patterns are the very language of the universe. Okay. Think about how you recognize a familiar face or how you can predict the next note in your favorite song. Right. Wiener believed that understanding those patterns, that's the key to understanding how both humans and e-machines make sense of the world. So everything from the rhythm of music to the structure of the human body, even something as simple as counting pennies, it's all patterns. Precisely. Wiener argued that these patterns, defined by relationships, by structures, they form the basis of everything around us. And what's remarkable is how he applied this to both the natural world and the machines we build. That's where this idea of machines as information processors comes into play, right? Yeah. Even back then, he saw a link between how WE understand the world and how machines might too. He did. And music is a great example of this. Imagine listening to a complex symphony. Okay. It seems almost magical, right? <laughs> but Wiener pointed out that mathematically that symphony can be broken down into simpler patterns using something called Fourier's theorem. Uh-oh. You're going to have to walk me through this. <laughs> My math skills are a bit rusty. Ah, don't worry. It's more about the principle than the equations. Essentially, any complex waveform, like a musical note, can be represented as a combination of simpler waves. And this mathematical breakdown, this is something machines excel at. So Wiener saw a parallel between the way W.E. hear and process music and a way a machine might break that same music down into its fundamental patterns. It's like they're speaking the same language, just in different ways. That's a great way to put it. And this understanding of patterns, it wasn't just theoretical for Wiener. He saw it as fundamental to how we transmit information. He even talked about this concept called modulation, which is essentially sending multiple messages over a single line without them interfering with each other. Kind of like what happens when you listen to streaming music today. Now that you mention it, streaming music, noise canceling headphones, those technologies rely on processing information in very specific ways. And that all goes back to Wiener's understanding of patterns in communication. Exactly. 
It's incredible to think he was already laying the groundwork for these technologies back in the 1950s. But what's even more fascinating is that he recognized this was just the tip of the iceberg. He believed this parallel between human and machine information processing, it had profound implications for how we understand ourselves, our place in the world. It's a lot to unpack. Yeah. And we're just getting started. Welcome back. We're really getting into the core of Wiener's thinking now, how he saw the world as this symphony of patterns understood by humans and D, the machines we create. But as we go deeper into the human use of human beings, there's also this note of caution. Right. It's like he's giving us this blueprint for incredible technological advancement, but he's also like, hey, watch your step. There are some potholes along the way. That's a great way to put it. So what were some of those concerns that kept him up at night? One that feels really relevant today is the possibility of technology being used for exploitation and control instead of for, you know, making things better for humanity. Wiener was really aware of how technology could be co-opted, used to concentrate power, maybe even amplify existing inequalities instead of erasing them. It's interesting, right, because you often think of technology as inherently democratizing, like information at your fingertips tools accessible to anyone. You'd think so, but... But Wiener saw a darker side to all that accessibility. He did. He argued that simply having access to technology doesn't automatically level the playing field. He was worried that without thinking carefully, technology could be used to manipulate people, especially those who don't fully understand how it works. It's like he could see those issues coming down the pipeline, right? Yeah. Algorithmic bias, misinformation spreading online. It's uncanny how much he got right makes his warnings about the exploitation of the American West even more resonant, doesn't it? Exactly. Wiener saw those historical events, the depletion of resources, the disregard for indigenous communities, all of it as cautionary tales. And he recognized this dangerous pattern, this exploitation that could easily repeat itself with these powerful new technologies. It speaks to how attuned he was to the human cost of all this progress. Was that concern for exploitation limited to social structures? Or did he see it kind of seeping into our relationship with the technology itself? He saw risks on both fronts, actually. He worried about things like the vulnerability of increasingly interconnected systems, the unintended consequences of technologies like food processing, even the environmental impact. He was raising alarms about resource depletion and pollution long before it was a mainstream concern. It's almost eerie how much his writing from the 1950s mirrors the anxieties we have in the 21st century. Climate change, social inequality, the erosion of privacy. Did he offer any solutions? Like, what did he think we should do about all this? Well, Wiener wasn't one to just point out problems without offering some ways forward. He believed we could steer technology in a more humane direction. But it required a real shift in our thinking. A new way to define progress, you could say. So not just bigger labs and more funding, but a fundamental change in what our priorities. Exactly. He thought a siloed approach to knowledge just wouldn't cut it. We needed, he argued, a new kind of thinking, something that brought together science, the humanities, and a deep sense of responsibility to society. This wasn't just about the what of technological advancement then, but also the how and the why. Right. And crucially, who is involved in making those decisions? One of the things that struck me was his take on artificial intelligence. This was clearly something he was fascinated by, even in those early days of computing. He compared how humans and machines process information, but he also recognized that there were some key differences. Absolutely. He used this example of early computing machines and how they relied on taping for their operation. Taping. Yeah. Imagine feeding instructions into a computer by physically punching holes into a card. Each hole represented a piece of information. That's wild. Right. And he saw a connection between that and the way our own brains make new connections when we learn. So he's comparing the physical taping of a machine to like the synapses in our brain firing and making connections as we learn and adapt. Exactly. But while he saw that analogy, he also cautioned against taking it too far. Because as good as machines might get at mimicking certain aspects of human intelligence, there's a certain something extra, right? A depth to human thought that goes beyond just processing information. A hundred percent. Things like intuition, emotional intelligence, creativity, these were all part of the human experience that Wiener believed were fundamentally different from how machines operated. He was wary of us relying too much on machines, especially for decisions that require empathy, nuanced judgment, things like that. So it wasn't just this fear of machines becoming you know, sentient or taking over the world. It was more about the subtle ways that our own humanity might be diminished 
if we ceded too much control to these systems that don't share that same depth of understanding. That's a really insightful way to put it. It's like he was worried about us creating a world that's super efficient and predictable, but stripped of all the things that make us human. And this worry wasn't limited to AI, by the way. He also applied this to automation in general, what he called the second industrial revolution. That's a phrase we hear all the time now, right? Usually with a mix of excitement and apprehension, too. What was his take on how automation might change society? He definitely saw the potential for machines to take over a lot of the repetitive, even dangerous tasks, which, you know, could free up humans for more creative and fulfilling work. But he was also realistic about the potential for social and economic upheaval if we didn't manage those changes thoughtfully and ethically. So not saying stop progress, but saying if we're going to do this, we need to do it right. Exactly. He believed things like retraining programs, social safety nets, even a more equitable distribution of wealth would be essential to make sure that the benefits of all this automation were shared by everyone, not just a select few. It's incredible how he ties all these threads together, the nuts and bolts of how machines process information to these massive societal shifts that technology could unleash. So we've talked about Wiener's concerns about the potential downsides of technology, but he also sought a path forward, didn't he? It wasn't all doom and gloom. Definitely not. And a big part of his vision, maybe even the core of it, was education. But not just in the way we usually think about it. Not just. Like, everyone learned to code. Right. He believed we needed to be much more critical in how we think about technology, its implications, the consequences, even the ethics of it all. And he thought that should be woven into education from the very beginning. So understanding technology isn't just about knowing how to use it, but also grappling with its place in society. Like, what are the trade-offs? What could go wrong? What does this new tech mean for us as human beings? That's it, exactly. He wanted people to be equipped to ask those tough questions, not just be wowed by the latest gadget. And this wasn't just about individual responsibility either. He put a lot of emphasis on the people actually creating this technology, right? Like the engineers, the scientists, they need to be thinking about these things too. Absolutely. Wiener felt strongly that those creators, they have a responsibility to think about the bigger picture. Not just can we build it, but should we? And if so, how? So stepping back from that purely technical perspective to consider the human impact, I mean, if we don't, it feels like the pursuit of technology could become detached from its purpose. Almost like we're just building things for the sake of building them without really understanding the consequences. Exactly. He was afraid of that. Wiener believed that kind of ethical reflection is essential, making sure that technology serves its purpose, you know, enriching human lives, not diminishing them. That idea of purpose feels central to his message, doesn't it? Like, it's not enough to simply create. We also need to be mindful of the why behind the what. But this responsibility, it goes way beyond the labs and research centers. He was also a big advocate for an engaged citizenry, right? Like wow. everyday people being a part of these conversations. A hundred percent. He didn't think we should just leave these big decisions to the so-called experts. Wiener felt strongly that we all have a role to play in demanding accountability, in shaping the future we want to see. It's a call to action for all of us. Don't just be a passive consumer of technology, be an active participant. Because these aren't just abstract debates about ones and zeros. They're deeply human questions we're grappling with. Right. And that's really the core of Wiener's message, I think. He understood that technology has this incredible power, but it's a double-edged sword. It can elevate us, but it can also erode the very things that make us human. Our freedom, our autonomy, even our ability to connect with each other in meaningful ways. He doesn't offer any easy answers in the human use of human beings, and I don't think there are any. But he gives us this powerful framework for thinking about these questions, this complex dance between humanity and technology. He really does. And in a way, it's a hopeful book because Wiener believed in us. He believed in our capacity to make wise choices, to use technology for good. It just takes vigilance, a commitment to our values, and the courage to keep asking those tough questions. The human use of human beings, it's a challenging read, but absolutely essential, especially today. It reminds us that when it comes to technology, we're not just passengers along for the ride. We're the ones holding the map. And choosing the destination. That's a great place to leave it. Until next time, keep exploring, keep questioning, and keep diving deep.